So yes, uh, my name is Ellie Rose. Um, I am a product of art education, um, a very happy one. Um, when I was in my high school years, um, I was telling many students today in my visits that my father never wanted me to major in the arts. He thought it was something really cute <laughs> that I used to do, um, and that I needed to do something more substantial, um, and I needed to make money. Um, it was very important to him that I was successful, and successful meant making money. So when I started um, thinking about what I wanted to do for school, um, I just began drawing. These are some sketches that I did in, in high school, and it's just something that I was always good at, but it wasn't something that I knew that I could succeed at. I decided to stay committed, and I was committed to my fine arts, and I applied for college. I was born right in this area in St. Charles, Illinois. Uh, moved up to Wisconsin and ended up getting a full tuition scholarship to NIU where I decided to major in art education because fine arts wasn't good enough. I had to be an art educator. That held some sort of substantial weight to it. So I started majoring in art ed and as I got going, I just wasn't happy. I wasn't able to apply my skills like I was in high school. I had this great supportive energy in high school. I had great professors. I had five art teachers in my high school. I was in private schools and moved to public schools just to get a better art education. And I just didn't find that support where I was at. I began thinking about ways that I could apply, apply the education that I had. So I got out of art education and looked into nursing. Complete shift complete shift. My father was happy, but I was not. I ended up studying abroad and got really connected to my art skills and what it meant to be an artist. I committed myself to painting. I'm the student that they say, oh, we're not educating students to move on to be artists. But I needed somebody to educate me and to push me to be an artist. I would later find out that it was those art skills that helped set me apart from everybody else. So I stayed committed and finished my bachelor's degree in fine art. Now what? Now I still was at that same point, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so I went to visit this woman. This woman is my grandmother. Her name is Ruth. She was living with Alzheimer's for 14 years, which is a very long time to live with Alzheimer's. And she was unable to communicate with me. And I would just hold her hand, and she would squeeze it, and we shared glances. And I just knew nothing about what Alzheimer's was, except that they can't remember anything. There was times I remember visiting her in her assisted living, and she would hold my hand, and she would look at me, and she would say, you got to get me out of here. You got to get me out of here. And I kept just breaking my heart. Well, I can't. You're, you're not safe. I, I can't do that for you. And then I would leave and, and come back. But this woman, this powerful woman, this very prestigious woman who created a beautiful family, who was intelligent, loved fashion, loved to cook, loved to have us all over, lived in the same community that all of you live in, and I watched her, and I just could not believe what was happening to her. And nobody knew anything about it. They're like, yes, this is what happens. This is what happens as we age. Now, my grandmother was resilient, very resilient. She escaped from that assisted living. We weren't going to get her out, so she escaped from the assisted living. She was missing for three days in the cold, cold October in Wisconsin. A dog and a police officer found her three days later. She had burrowed and buried herself into the ground to keep warm, this resilient woman. They thought she had passed, and then they heard her voice. They brought her to the hospital. We walked in. We said, Graham, where have you been? I don't know. She didn't know where she had been, but she was smiling. And I just kept thinking, like, we have no idea what's going on in her mind. Nobody's asking her. Nobody's trying other ways of communicating. All we can say is she does not fit, and she doesn't remember what we are expecting her to remember. And I started to think about expectations. What do people expect out of me because I'm an artist? What do people not expect out of me? 
what do people expect out of my grandmother? And now that she has Alzheimer's, what do people not expect out of her? You know, when do we hit that point? When do we transition to being an elder? You know, what age is it? Do you have that birthday? And then you're like, all right, it's official. I am an elder. It doesn't happen. And so if we started to look at things as if we were all aging, that I'm aging and you're aging, what would it mean if people could see the things that I could see as an artist? And how could I change the way people were looking at things? How could I be the artist in the middle of a healthcare system that's helping people see the way that we're treating people, caring for people, and what the arts can do to bring out the people that are inside? This beautiful woman ended up in a nursing home after she escaped because that's what the law said. She now needed to be in a locked building because now she's an even bigger danger to society. So she lived out the remainder of her years in a very lovely nursing home, and she waited. She waited daily for us to visit. She waited daily for somebody to take her to the bathroom. She waited daily to eat. She waited. She waited there to die. And when I was reaching the end of my college years, I remember going to visit her and just sitting with her and just feeling this emotion, yet we weren't talking. And there was just something so powerful about that and nobody was talking about it. Like, how are we not talking about this? So I started just to play with her. I was like, well, let's just do things that don't involve talking. Why do I, instead of saying, do you remember what you had for breakfast today, why don't I just hang out with her? So I brought the piano over. She put her hands on the piano and she started playing. I brought paint over. I didn't know what we were gonna paint. She didn't know either, but we painted together. She started talking to me. She wouldn't talk to anybody else, <laughs> but she would talk to me. And I would whisper in her ear, I love you, Graham. And she would smile and close her eyes and she would just feel her skin. This beautiful Irish skin she had, she would feel it. And we would go outside and she would feel the wind. But that's not what the medical profession was looking at. So I made a commitment to myself that I needed to figure out what the connection was. If the medical field wasn't looking at it, no other field was really looking at it. What was me, this little old artist? What was I going to do? So I was struggling at that time in a job. I was a wedding planner and catering director, working long, long hours. And I just got so burnt out. And I decided to go to Google. And I Googled arts and dementia. I found this crazy job in Milwaukee called a person-centered care specialist. I had never heard of one of those, and I bet you haven't either. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a common thing, but it's not something my parents ever dreamed that I would be applying for. But it had things in the description that fit me. So they had this program called Art Care. Wow, art and care together? That seemed interesting. They had things about leadership and about business and about activity planning. Those were things that I could do. When I was going through um, uh, uh, high school and going through college, I took many different courses. You know, I was in nursing, I actually was in occupational therapy for a moment, art ed, art therapy, adaptive art, integrative art, you name it, I had tried it. But this whole, you know, a bunch of things that I was majoring in gave me all the skills to apply for this job. So I applied, and so this healthcare system hired an artist, they put me right in the middle of a program, and they said, what do you think? So they brought in somebody from the outside and my critical thinking skills, all of these things that the students were talking about today, how we could look at things differently, the discipline that I had to try and make something work to figure this out, and really my skills in building relationships. Just like what Chip was saying, how do we connect to each other? And why is that important? And how do we find meaning? So as I began working, I learned about many different arts and dementia programs. I worked with the Alzheimer's Association with a Memories in the Making program. They have all kinds of different uh, programs that exist that just help people sit in front of a piece of paper and do something different. However, the critical part of me that you are all learning in your high school years um, here at the schools, um, it wasn't good enough for me. If we put a piece of paper in front of somebody, just like you, you don't know what to draw. <laughs> How do we dig down deep inside of ourselves and think about what is it that I want to draw? Should I draw something in front of me? Do I draw something that I dream about? What is it that I'm drawing about? So I began asking questions. I talked to people with all different kinds of dementia. Alzheimer's is just one. 
that affects just our memory. There's dementias that affect our language, that affect our ability to turn around. As it progresses, we see all kinds of different symptoms and behaviors. And I started to look at them as assets. When I watch somebody paint who wasn't able to rationalize if it was good or bad, I was so envious. What if I could paint like that? What if I could paint with this freedom and not think about who's going to like it or not? Can you imagine what my paintings would look like? Maybe then I would be good enough, that arts would be good enough to be a profession. Maybe then it would be. So I started to ask more questions about abilities. I started taking people to museums. I started going out to eat with them and just soaking in everything I could learn about dementia, about their lives, and about building relationships. I started using new materials. Instead of using craft paper and crayons, I started looking at professional art materials and what people could do with them. We played with different things, with wax and colored pencils and different things that might be more traditional, but also throwing things off of buildings and putting paint in water balloons and just throwing them. This experience of the arts is often overlooked. Not so much what we're producing, but the experience of being together and making the arts was something that was value to people living with dementia. I want to tell you a couple stories about some people that I've met that have impacted my life. This is Robert. Robert and I used to love to make art together. Uh, at this point in my career, I'm now the uh, manager of an adult day center, and I have about 45 to 55 people a day that I get to make art with all day. And this man was living on the street often, and sometimes in a care home. And he suffered from a dementia from um, drinking too much alcohol throughout his life. He was very aggressive, very angry. But when he was making art, he was calm. And the smile you see on his face is the only time we ever saw that smile. We made art with all kinds of things, with sticks we found on walks, random paper, T-shirts that were printed with .com instead of .org, eh, free materials. <laughs> All these things we would just rip up, deconstruct, put back together. And the relationships we built while doing this, all the learning I received from it, and the meaning that he gave me and the meaning that he had in his life for what he created, these things would not exist without him. So now we're looking at purpose. When we help somebody live in a nursing home, we're taking them out of our society. We're saying you're no longer worthy. You're not worthy enough to contribute back into society. So we're taking you out of your home, and we're going to put you in this place because you're safe. The safety factor becomes our driving, our driving course. It's kind of like the test scores in school. There's this one thing we're focused on, and we're missing the meaning that's coming at all sides. He also got very interested in his brain. So we started talking about the brain, all the different kinds of dementia. What does the brain look like? The doctor said, I have this thing, and now I don't even know much about it. And we have plaques, these plaques in our brain. What, what is a plaque? I have plaques on my teeth. I have plaques in my heart. Now I have plaques in my brain. What is that? And so many of us hear the word dementia, but we really have no idea what it is. And the medical field doesn't either. But what we do know about is how to build relationships. He went on to make art with me for the next two years. He made at least five pieces a day. He was so prolific. He just kept making it and making it, just like Vincent van Gogh did, just, just crank them out. And these bright colors coming straight from his head. Oh my goodness, I would love to be able to just come up with images like that and then paint them. Again, I'm in a point of envy. I really love this, this piece because if you notice, it's actually done on a piece of newspaper that is the death notice. On the bottom, it says death notice. So he chose this very specific newspaper to do this drawing on. I then took my practices, and I started working with more colleagues, worked with people that were researchers, worked with um, other nurses and doctors, and shared with them what I was learning. So I was really good at making a team. I learned that in my art education as well. How do I socialize and work on a team? So I worked with these people, and we began designing a course to exercise the brain and body through the arts. So this piece is about pouring art, not painting, but pouring art. And each of those colors represents a superfood for the brain. The brown is dark chocolate, my favorite. That's good for your brain. The green is spinach, the red beets, and the blue blueberries. 
How can we teach people about superfoods for the brain through the arts so that when they go home, they're eating those foods? Less than 10% of people live in a nursing home when they're elders. There's all these other people at home. How was I going to start to get the arts practices in homes? How do I keep educating people about what I've learned? After that point, I started working with more museums. And how do I get their artwork in museums? The Milwaukee Art Museum and many of the museums in Milwaukee. And I've been out to New York and many other different states and now countries to get this artwork up. It's not children's artwork. It's powerful artwork that is made from people that have a purposeful and meaningful thing to contribute. What is contribution? We all have the ability to contribute, but we're not asking enough of elders and what they want to contribute. We think it's cute they have stories to tell. And we think it's cute, like a little cute little old lady. But this contribution, this is worthiness, this wisdom that we think that elders have, how are we asking them to contribute? After working with museums, I went on to attend the National Leading Age Leadership Academy, a graduate study program. I was one of 30 out of very many people that had applied. And what got me in that program was the fact that I was an artist. I was in this program with CEOs, CFOs. Oh god, <laughs> you should have seen me the day that I showed up. I was like, how am I going to compete with this? But I showed up. I showed up confident because I knew what I had learned. I talked with all these CEOs and CFOs and all these leadership uh, people that are running organizations across the country, and we shared ideas. And now I continue working with them, and we have this commitment to change the way that we care for people. This project I work with with a group of eight people in my program, and we had, to, to, we had the challenge to attack a gap in aging services, and ours was value in society. How can we express and, and do a visual representation of people's value in society? So we asked people across the nation to donate one object. So elders donated objects, sent them in the mail, and then we worked with a group to sculpt this image um, through technology so everyone could watch it online. And so all these little pieces that you see on there are given by an elder, and then they wrote something about why that was valuable to them. Those notes then got read into poetry and they were recorded by the voices of the people that donated them. So we had a visual, an audio, and also a very dramatic presentation of this piece. Now this piece, I wish I had more pictures of it, but before it was on exhibition, it was stolen, which at first was hurt by so many people. How adults and elders had given us these objects, like we were shepherds, we were supposed to keep them, and we had lost them. But the person that took this, didn't understand the value of elders. And it wasn't until my way of looking at things as an artist for me to tell all of the people that this was the perfect ending to the story, that this piece was stolen so we continue to see how we are not valuing elders. And we re then redid the process. Now this process can be redone over and over and over again. And the lesson can be learned over and over and over again. But it wouldn't have had the publicity unless it was stolen. So it's a great project, one that you know anybody can contribute to. As I continued working, I began um, not only talking to elders, but thinking about the philosophy of aesthetics and the philosophy of art. Um, myself, in my pastime, I love to write, and I have these great ideas. I like to think I do anyway. And I write a lot, and I would talk to the people I was working with, and they would just investigate things. They weren't just looking at things and saying, I like it, I don't like it. They were really tearing apart these ideas. And I got to thinking more about what is it that helps them investigate. How can somebody with a cognitive impairment investigate something? What do I need to ask them in order to get them to be thinking that way? Because this was complex thinking. This wasn't some generic trivia game that we were playing. This wasn't arts and crafts time. This wasn't throwing a beach ball around the room. This was intense, complex thinking. And it was so fun, because we know that the arts are fun. When I started working on this, uh, just like in education, the arts programs and creative programming and adult day services budgets were cut. So my position was eliminated. 
So here I had someone believe in me to hire an artist. I'd grown in this company, became, became a manager, went on to the leadership education. My leadership skills were excelling, and then the floor taken out from underneath me. How was I going to start again? Well, the artist and courageous woman that I am, I decided I wasn't going to fit in another long-term care facility, that it was time for me to do my own thing. There was more that I wanted to do. I started Jero Start Inc. just over a year ago. I wanted to teach people my practices of living more creatively, of learning. I have a commitment to teach other artists of what you can do out of high school, <laughs> what you can do in college, and what it takes to create your own degree, to create your own major, to create your own career, and to also learn more about enlightenment, that each one of our enlightenments is different. How can we be more enlightened each day? Because that's what the elders have taught me, to be more enlightened. I created programs for artists and non-artists alike. I love this photo of the two men. We did some uh, punching bag uh, painting. We put paint on the end and punched the canvas. But this gentleman was a boxer, and he passed away just last year at 52 with cognitive impairment from boxing. The man on the left, uh, who is also very young, is a philosopher, a theologian, one of my just favorite people. I've known him for about five years. Uh, just so smart, and he's living with frontal lobe dementia, so he can think and remember things, but he can't communicate them with his, with his words. And the woman on the left, who is a uh, psychiatric nurse, uh, she just loves to paint. She gives me great energy, and she's living with mild cognitive impairment. So these are some sessions with her. These are her paintings, someone who can't remember. We paint with her, and then we go back, and she paints over what we painted the day before. And you know who, who it is hard on? It's hard on me. She gets to start over every day, and she just loves it. She has this great energy. So we paint together. For the non-artists, we do things like sanding. I like to find found objects because I don't have a lot of money for materials. So we like to find garbage and find different things we can repurpose. And this man, Paul, he taught me about dancing and about shadows. He stops me anytime I think I'm on the right track, you know, because I'm so smart. I'm like, we're going to do this and this, and we're going to research this and evaluate that. And he just shows me how to dance. He looked at this tree, and he found shapes in it. And he's, he's making his body look like that. He's stopping me and showing me and teaching me how to see again. These found objects we make into different sculptures. We take walks. We have other people that join us. He finds these different colors. We make art out of everything, every single thing we see. So it doesn't have to have this big process. It's right in the moment. It's right in the moment I meet him where he's at. He's gone on to learn how to paint and draw with me. And this piece, which is much bigger in real life, is one of his favorites. He describes this piece as his brain. And when he describes this as his brain, I wish I could come up with some beautiful thing to say about it, but I think it speaks for itself on how he views himself. I started working with small groups. Once I was working one-on-one, -on -one, I went into small groups. I worked with Vietnamese refugees who were blind and didn't have some limbs. So we started being blindfolded, listened to music, made art together. These were some of the pieces that came out of that. These are pieces I think I would hang in my home. They're so beautiful. So I started working with students, blindfolding them. And I started to think about what it would mean to have a global impact, not just Milwaukee. So I started working in Mexico and all across the United States. I do this exercise with many different people, all kinds of different cultures, all kinds of different age groups. And these lines where we think we're not an artist, they start to come to life. People start to have more energy. They start to use colors, and they start to live more creatively. They're learning more creatively, and the enlightenment I hear proves that we're successful. I work with groups um, of people that are in different companies, people that want to learn more about aging, people that just want to be more creative in general. And these pieces hang in our gallery. They might look like um, splotches of paint to you, but I can hear the music when I look at these. And I know the people that made them. We often sell pieces of artwork. That's how we get funded as a nonprofit. We make money off of selling our artwork. And some of these pieces are now hanging in different corporations uh, in their lobbies. And they all come from the experience of the arts. 
One of my favorite exercises to do is to rip up art. Um, I was with a group of students today, I can't remember, I'm looking at a group over here, maybe it was you I was talking to, um, but I had an exercise when I was in college of making a hundred different uh, pieces of ceramic ware in one week. So all those of you that know anything about ceramics, that seems like near impossible, and it was, but I did it because of my art education. I was committed, disciplined, I was gonna be the winner, I was gonna do it, and I did. I made a hundred pieces in one week. And the teacher took us up to the roof and we had to throw them all over the side. And it was really about the process of making art, not being connected so much to what the product was, but to focus more on the process. I guess it was a great lesson. I did learn something. I'm still talking about it. But we make pieces also in my practices where we then rip them up and put them back together. Students love this. I give them a challenge to make the piece as big as they can and they go over the ceiling. They go everywhere. I like to talk about art. We go to, like I said, we go to museums. We talk about what art is, art, not art. Um, do you ever look at a urinal or something and you think, oh my God, that is just not art. Well, when I do it with elders, they're always talking and they have great, great investigative uh, properties to why it is and why it is not. So currently, right now, uh, I'm working in Mexico, in Mexico City. I'm working with adult day programs with the main objective to keep people at home and to use the arts to engage them throughout the day. We do things like tango dancing, which I don't know how to do, I'm learning, and <laughs> going to different museums. And I just truly value what it has been like to go on this journey, to be able to be reflective with all of you today in your classrooms, and to think about how truly valuable my art education was, and the support that I had from my teachers. It took me from being an artist that was painting in her studio who was at the forefront of possibly being a starving artist and applying my skills to writing methods, working with researchers, coming up with new concepts, coming up with new plans, and being successful. And most importantly, having the relationships that I do and being fully satisfied with the work that I do. I'm very proud of the work that I do and I'm proud of my art education but I'm very, very proud that I can finally say that I am an artist. I happen to be so many other things in life, but first and foremost, I am an artist.